and we want to continue on in our study today. We've been going through the book of James, and today we're going to continue with that by, uh, we're still in James chapter 1, but we're going to look today at verses 19 and 20, James 1, 19 and 20, and the verse is there on your study sheet. And it says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. And I want to pick up on what Marion was saying there. Uh, we live in a day of anger right now. I don't know if you realize it. But we just got through one of the nastiest elections that I've ever witnessed uh, in my short time on this earth. But uh, both, and I just will call one side Democrats and one side Republicans, uh, there seemed to be anger from both sides. In fact, I saw a news article uh, today on my computer, and it said, Good riddance to Donald Trump. And then I saw another article that said the election was stolen by the Democrats with illegal votes. And so there's this tension on both sides. Uh, my son, I was talking to him last night, and he said that he uh, had met this lady at uh, the gym that he goes to, a really nice lady, and he had have several conversations with her. And so he uh, saw her on Facebook. And so he got on her Facebook page, and he said this mild-mannered lady was spewing all kinds of hate and anger about the election. And, uh, and even Marion was saying that you got an email from somebody that said if, if you supported a certain candidate, they didn't want to be your friend anymore. Uh, and so uh, we've all witnessed this. There's just a lot of anger, a lot of hate out there right now. Uh, and then the coronavirus, you know, we've, we've been dealing with that as well. And some are saying, well, it's, it's all a hoax. We don't need to wear masks. Why are we social distancing? Let's get the economy going. And then there's others that are saying, no, this is real and people are dying and we need to pay attention and take precautions. And so there's two sides on that. Um, there was a battle about the Supreme Court. There was a vacancy on the Supreme Court. One side said, uh, let's go ahead and fill that vacancy. We, we can do that through the Constitution. The other side said, no, you can't do that. You should wait until after the election uh, and let the people decide. So two sides on that. Global warming. Some people are saying that we're destroying our planet by... Uh, fossil fuels and pollution and others are saying no there's nothing to that and there seem to be strong opinions on both sides uh, protests uh, we've all witnessed especially in our city nearby of Portland how protests uh, were, were taking place and some were saying well the, we need to enforce the law and when laws are broken people need to be arrested and prosecuted Others said, no, let's cut them some slack, and they're just expressing themselves. And there's a lot. So you've seen all this back and forth. Uh, all, and then, of course, the, the death of George Floyd uh, sparked race relations. And so we've been through a lot this year in 2020, and a lot of it has spurred anger in people for various reasons. So uh, I would conclude by just saying uh, there's, lots of people, there's lots of reasons why people are angry right now. And, and maybe you're angry for an even different reason. But we all go through these times where we have strong feelings about things and we want to express them. But today, as Christians, I want to ask the question, how can I stay calm in a world filled with anger? Because the tendency is you want to jump in on one side or the other. You want to get involved. But as Christians, we need to stay calm in a world filled with anger. How can we do that? Well, number one in your notes there, 
Realize the high cost of anger. You always lose when you lose your temper. You always lose when you lose your temper. Proverbs 29, 22 from uh, the Taylor Living Bible says, a hot-tempered man starts fights and gets into all kinds of trouble. And we've all witnessed people that have just lost it or had a meltdown and said things that they regretted saying and did things that were stupid and that they, you know, once it's out of the, out of the bag, it's hard to, to take it back. Um, years ago, Ann and I were living in Southern California. We attended a church there. And the pastor of the church, this church had a church basketball team. And yeah. <laughs> anybody, any of you that have ever played church basketball, uh, you would think that would be a Christian thing. Uh, no, it's anything but Christian. <laughs> and tempers tend to flare sometimes. But uh, on this particular team, the pastor's son was on the basketball team. And so the pastor would go to the games and cheer for his son, as you would expect. But sometimes his cheering got a little out of control, and he would try to help the referees with their job, and that got out of hand, and there were times where he just got uh, out of hand, out, out, out of control, and had a meltdown, so much so that the elders of the church wound up banning him from going to the church basketball games because he got so out of hand. And eventually, it led to him resigning from the church. It was that bad. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 25 addresses that. It says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, skillful in teaching, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. Now, <clears throat> those verses are not just for pastors or elders, they're for all of us, that as the bondservants of the Lord, we must not be quarrelsome. We don't want to be angry. All right, number two in your notes, uh, not only is it, does anger have a high cost, but resolve to manage and control your anger. What we give into eventually controls us. So Romans 6, verse 16 says, Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. When we give in to our anger, what we give in to eventually controls us. So when we give in to anger, we become controlled by anger and to the point where it's very difficult. It uh, seems like it's hard to control. Uh, Proverbs 29.11 says, A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man holds it in check. And you've heard of this concept of uh, venting your anger. Have you ever heard anyone say, you make me so mad? Well, is it you that's making me mad or is it me that's choosing to be angry? It's your choice. No one can make you mad. You have to choose to do that on your own. You have to give someone permission to make you angry. And uh, I know that's not what our culture says, but that's the, the truth. Now, one popular therapy for anger management is called venting. You've probably heard of this. And the theory goes like this, that you are like a pressure cooker. And steam builds up within you because certain things don't go your way, or somebody does something or cuts you off in traffic. And all these things build up steam, just like a pressure cooker. And if you don't let the steam out, the pressure cooker will eventually explode. And nobody wants that to happen. So the therapy says that you need to let off steam. That's how you get rid of anger. Well, 
Uh, that's not exactly true. That's not what the Bible says, and that's not the way that God made us. Uh, one family took that, actually, took that advice. They had a son. He was always seemed to have a problem with anger growing up. And then he became a teenager, and so he would have these outbursts of anger that just seemed to be uncontrollable. And so they came up with a plan, and they bought a, a big punching bag, one of, the, one of these body bag, punching bags. And so whenever he got angry, they would say, okay, go out to the garage and work off your anger with the punching bag. So he'd go out there for five or 10 or 15 minutes and he'd punch his heart out to the point where he was exhausted and then he would come in. And, and then for that moment, the, the anger had supposedly dissipated. But what I, we noticed as the years went by that eventually he got married, his marriage fell apart. Uh, eventually he got jobs, but he couldn't keep a job. He was always going from one to the next because he never got this anger problem under control. The venting doesn't work. The fact is that what we practice tends to become a habit. If we do something over and over, like venting our anger, we're just practicing that, and we're never getting it under control. In fact, you could practice the piano or a musical instrument and if you did, you would get good at doing that. Uh, or you could, if you like to read, the more you read, the better you get at reading. Or you could study the Bible. The more we study the Bible, the better we get at knowing the Lord. Or you could practice anger and you'd get really good at expressing your anger. If you do that over and over through venting, you just get better at it. And that's not good. So, number three, how else can we control our anger? Reflect before reacting. Think before you speak. Listening diffuses anger. And controlling your anger means controlling your tongue. Tongue. Yeah, that's what James 1.19 says. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now, I used to work in customer service, and customer service is just a nice word for listening to people that are really mad and trying to deal with them. Um, I worked for Sprint cell phones, and so, People would call in, and they never really called in to tell you how good of a job you were doing or how they loved Sprint telephones. They always called in because there was a problem, because they were angry about the way things weren't working, and they didn't mind telling you and expressing it. And so when I was first working there, this person called in, and part of our job was to diffuse the anger. And I thought that my job was to solve their problem. And so this fella called in and he started to rant and rave about this and that. And I, I knew th that I had the solution. And so I said, I can solve that for you. And I said, here's what you need to do. And I started to tell him blah, 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 blah. And he said, you're not listening to me. And I thought, well, I thought I was, but... Uh, so then he started to go on again, and he brought up another problem. Well, I knew how to solve that. And so I told him, well, what you need to do is... Da, da, da. And he said, you're not listening to me. And he said this three or four times. And finally he said, I need to talk to your supervisor. You're not listening to me. And so I had to take, refer him to the next person at the line. And my trainer pulled me aside after that and said, do you know what happened there? And I said, well, I was trying to solve his problems and he just wouldn't take that. And my trainer said, the problem was you weren't listening to him. He, all he wanted was someone to listen. He didn't really want his problem to be solved. 
He just wanted someone to listen. And isn't that true in our society that sometimes people get so frustrated that all they want is someone to take the time to listen to them. And that's why James says here, my beloved brethren, be quick to hear, be quick to listen. Uh, we need to take the time to do that. Uh, if you listen long enough, you will discover the real issue. But it takes time. Does it? Yeah. All right. Thomas Jefferson, years ago, he was the guy that said, if you're angry, count to ten. And we all know that we've heard that, right? But he went on. <laughs> She's counting to ten right there. Uh, but if you're really angry, count to a hundred. I've never heard that part, but uh, that's what he said. So anyway, this you know, my beloved brethren, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Number four, reprogram your mind with God's word to get rid of anger. And we talked about this concept before, but it, it is true. Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So the key is changing our mind, changing the way that we think about things. And you all remember the story of Cain and Abel. I've got it listed for you there in your notes, but it was that Cain decided to give an offering to God. And so he was a farmer, and so he brought of some of the crops that he had grown, and he brought an offering to God. Now you'd think that God would be thankful for that and commend him for it. But then his brother, Abel, was a tender of flocks. He raised sheep. And so he brought of the first portions and of the best portions of his flock, and he brought his offering to God. And God had regard for Abel's offering, but he did not have regard for Cain's offering, and it made Cain angry. And so God pulled Cain aside, and he said, Why are, why are you angry, bro? <laughs> are you angry? Now, why are you angry? And God went on to say, if you're doing the right thing, then you will be commended. But if you're not, then sin is the problem and you need to deal with it because otherwise anger is going to control you and it's not going to be pretty. Now, he didn't say it exactly like that, but that was the gist of it. And did Cain get control of his anger? No, because the very next verse says, the next day, Cain took his brother out in the field. They had an argument. There was anger involved. And Cain killed his brother. And so the same thing God would say to us is if there's anger involved, we need to get a hold of that. We need to control it. Otherwise, it will control us. And the end picture, the end game, will not be pretty. Um, so, how do we control it? How do we do that? How do we change our mind about anger? Romans 12 says we need to reprogram our minds. We do that with God's Word. We know that God's Word is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it can change our lives. It does. It, it works a number on us as we learn it, as we memorize it, as we meditate upon it. And I want to, I've given you just three verses there that have been a great help to me in my personal life in getting control of my anger. And the first one is Proverbs 15.1. It says, A harsh word stirs up anger. But a soft answer turns away wrath. Now, I heard about a salesman one time. This was back when video stores were, were popular. And this, this guy was a, a salesman in a video store. And a customer came in that was angry. And so they sent the salesman out to deal with this lady that had a problem with, with this uh, video. 
And she was ranting and raving. And so he said, ma'am, you just need to calm down. <laughs> and she said, you need to calm down. Did, did that help? Nope. Telling her to calm down. No, that's not what you want to say to an angry person. A harsh word stirs up anger. But a soft answer turns away wrath. So, need to take that into consideration. Learn that verse. Claim it. Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now, you and I, because we have a sin nature, we think that it is our job, when someone offends us, it's our job to get back at them. To, to pay back. God says, no, that is my job. Leave that to me. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, not ours. And so uh, let's leave that with him. That will resolve a lot of anger when we can just step back and say, well, Lord, you take care of that. Uh, I guess I don't have to. No, it's not, that's not our job. James 1.20 says, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. When we get angry, we can be assured we're not in the will of God. That's not what he wants us to do. All right, we'll conclude with number five. And ask God to fill your heart with his unconditional love. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. So we need to ask God to fill us with his unconditional love. And uh, the verse there is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. It says love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. And the key there is it is not easily angered. It is not easily angered. That's in bold print there because that's what we want to emphasize True love, agape love, unconditional love, is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Now, when I was in a sophomore in high school, we, a, a youth minister was hired by our church, and he came in and he taught us for the first time in my life about God, this thing called agape love. And agape is a Greek word for love. They have several words for love where we just have one. But agape love is an unconditional love. It's, a, it's where God loves us no matter what we do. And you've all uh, learned the song, Jesus loves me, this I know. We learned that as little kids in church. For the Bible tells me so. Uh, and the second verse goes, Jesus loves me when I'm good. And for some of us, that's as far as we ever get. We think that God only loves us when we're good. But the second part says, Jesus loves me when I'm bad. Though it makes him very sad. Yes, Jesus loves me. And that little simple song that we've all learned is talking about God's unconditional love. He loves us no matter what, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter what we may do in the future, there is nothing we can do that can separate us from the love of God. It's, it's a, and when I learned that as a sophomore in high school, it changed my life. It changed the way I looked at God. It changed the way I looked at myself. It changed my whole view of Christianity, that God would love me no matter what. And here's the other thing. God expects us to treat other people the same way. That we are to have this same agape, unconditional love for each other, no matter what they do to us, no matter how they harm us, no matter how many times they do it, we are to still have this unconditional love for them. All right, we're going to close in, in a prayer. And uh, we just want to make this the desire of our heart to be able to not only receive God's love for ourselves, but to show unconditional love for others. And when we do, our anger will be taken care of. Father, 
we come humbly before your throne of mercy and grace and we confess that we have harbored anger in our hearts, Lord. And we thank you that you love us with an unconditional love, a love that accepts us and loves us no matter what we've done because Jesus paid the price for our sin when he shed his blood on the cross. And we also realize that you want us to love and accept others no matter what they've done to us. And Lord, we confess that this is very hard for us to do in our own power. In fact, it's impossible. So we ask that you would fill our hearts with your supernatural, unconditional love for others and that our anger and ugly hate would be removed from us and that we would stand pure and righteous in your sight, knowing that Jesus, when he died on the cross, took all our anger and sin away. And if we will only believe in him, we ask and we pray these things now in the name of Jesus. Amen.